Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, Medicare and Social Security, part three of our series on building a firm foundation for retirement. Well, welcome to our third segment on Medicare and Social Security. And I'm just going to go over a brief overview of each, especially since I went through this myself already. Let's look at Medicare for a moment. The government gives you seven months to sign up for Medicare under current law. The month that you are actually, your birthday month, you can actually sign up three months before your birthday month or three months after your birthday month. But you definitely want to sign up because you don't want to be paying penalties. Now, when I look at Medicare, I'm looking at when I turned 65, I actually went early just to make sure I could get covered and, 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 and filed early so there wouldn't be any problems. I filed early for Medicare. I was, already, I was still working. I still had a Part A. I signed up for Part B. And then I, now I'm into C and D. I'll get to that in a second. So I want to be able to make sure that I'm doing this. So you probably are getting pummeled with inbound mail. If you're close, if you're in your early 60s, you're getting all kinds of supplemental insurance, Medicare supplemental insurance propaganda to try to get you to pull one way or the other. Everybody's different. You'll have to look at what you feel, what your history has been on your health before you actually decide on a plan. My wife and I went through our plan. We, we really did a lot of due diligence and we came to a, uh, a plan that works for us. It's not for everybody, but it works for us. But the big thing is you need to sign up on time. And if you don't, there's going to be penalties. I'll get to that in a second. Part A, B, C, and Part D. These are the ones that are mentioned. There's a couple other parts, but really fundamentally for most of our discussion, we should be looking at Part A, B, C, and D. Part A is for your hospital coverage, your inpatient care, your critical access, and some, and I can't stress this, limited long-term care. If you're looking for Medicare to be your long-term care or Medicaid to be your long-term care play, I think you're making a major mistake. Medicare's version of long-term care is very short. It's, it's not something you should rely on. You should look to outside the actual government program of Medicare and secure some kind of long-term care. Part B is your doctor's visits, your outpatient care. And I like having my physical every year, regular issues. I really haven't had any real problems all my life. Almost every hospital visit has been sports injury related. And then there's Medicare Advantage plans or supplemental plans, depending upon how you look at your health. Now, some people have had very unhealthy problems in their life, and they really need to probably look at the probably the top of the line supplement. That could be between anywhere from $150 to $200 a person. So it's, it's not cheap, but you wouldn't have any deductible. You wouldn't have any copay. You're just paying the Cadillac version of a supplemental uh, a, a medical plan that could help. Now, there are cheaper ones. I saw a couple the other day when I reviewed this. There's some there that are pretty good for 100 bucks a month, but again, that's $100 for you, $100 for yourself. And remember, you're still paying $134 if you signed up on time. So you have $130 for, your, for yourself, $134 for your spouse. Now you're adding another tab to this through your supplement. Now, you could buy the top of the line coverage to, so that you have no deductible and no uh, copay, or you could buy a little bit lower so to save yourself some money with a little bit of copay and a little bit of deductible. There's ways that you, need, you can look at this for your own budget. But what I did is I have been very healthy. My wife has been very healthy. We've been married for 42 years, and we chose to do the Advantage plan through the health healthcare, through HealthNet, so that we have no premium payments, but we are, ex and we have a very low uh, copay, it's 10 bucks, but we have also an exposure up to $5,500. If something happened to us, we'd be on the hook. It won't be more than that, but we could pay up to $5,500 a piece. So we've elected, let's not have any premiums. Let's go ahead and use this Medicare C provision and do that. I don't recommend it if you don't have the history of good health. I don't recommend it if you're not doing diet and some kind of exercise. You really need to be in good shape. But in my view, that's another option. So you can do Cadillac for maybe $150 to $200, maybe more middle of the ground between $100 and $150, and $50 to $100 each so that you can go ahead and use your supplement to pay for things that Medicare doesn't pay for. And then finally, Part D. Now, Part D is a strange animal. It's supposed to be our drug coverage. And if you have a break in your coverage from the time that you leave work to the time that you get into Medicare, 
you're going to have to pay a penalty for that. So I looked at paying, should I pay the Obamacare premium to keep myself online, or should I pay the penalty on Medicare? When I looked at both of them side by side, it wasn't even a choice for myself. You have to make this choice for yourself. Remember, you need to be thinking about Medicare pricing about two years out. And by the way, Medicare looks back two years on your adjusted gross income. I'll show you that in a second. But remember, in drug, when you're talking about your drugs, it's really cheap under Medicare, but you might have to pay penalty if you have broken coverage between the time you sign up for D, Part D, and the time you left your employment. So just keep that in mind. But again, I looked at it. I paid the penalty. It was so cheap, I couldn't believe it. So I said, I'm not going to pay $1,000 a month when I could just go ahead under COBRA and then pay nothing, limp into Medicare, and pay the penalty. It's not for everybody. I'm just telling you what I did. Penalties for late enrollment, well, they give you penalties for each Part B and Part D, and they'll show you these penalties, and they use it as an annual enter. Again, remember, late enrollment, one year of late enrollment could cost you on your Plan B, they would add $10 to your $134, and if you're late for your monthly Part D at the same time, one year only, they're adding into the $390. Now, that's for you and your wife if you both came in late. But some of these penalties can get stiff. I have people that work till 70, and they said, hey, I have full coverage, but they forgot to sign up for Medicare when they were 65. These numbers, you're adding $52.50 on Part B and another 20 bucks on Part D if you've been five years out. These penalties are real, and you want to keep your expense loads as a senior as low as you can. So remember, two years before, you need to start thinking about how you're going to do this and make a segue or a transition from working to retirement. And Medicare is very strict about how you engage with it, but if you do it correctly, it's fantastic. And here's the adjusted gross income. You know, you remember the old bottom of the first page of your 1040, line 31? If you make, if you came into Medicare two years before, they're gonna go back two years on your employment, and if you made some serious money, you may have to pay more than the $134 a piece. So I tell people, if you're making really good money, you may want to defer it with your employer and to keep and tamp down this number. Look at some of our more affluent Americans are paying $428 a month because they make too much money. Medicare looks back the last two years. It's means tested. Make sure you're up to speed on it. It really matters. Now, Social Security. The pensions were invented in 1889 by, Ger by the German officer Otto von Bismarck. It was built for people who were living to age 70, but the average person in the German population only lived to age 48, so it was a great program. They never had any defaults. Social Security is not a solo decision. So when I'm looking at pensions and Social Security, I'm looking at it as a we decision, not just a he decision. And you, it'll affect your spouse's benefits. So if women outlive their husbands 87% of the time, you'll definitely want to look at this and say, okay, I need to make sure what's the best possible maximization of my benefit, not only for myself, but for my, my wife who will probably uh, succeed me. And remember, you don't want to lose out on money on this. So if you can stretch and wait till you're age 70 to take constructive receipt of your Social Security, you should do that. And remember, they say they'll give a cost of living, but remember, in the last seven years, three years, they didn't give any. And some of the years that they did give something, it was paltry. I mean, this year in 2017, I think it's 0.3. It's pretty pathetic. Look at the difference in benefit amounts. This is 62 when you can take constructive receipt, but it's not full retirement benefits. At age 66, part of the boomers are age 66, part of them are not. And then you look at age, my full retirement age would have been a $1,000 benefit. Let's just say it's $1,000. But if I wait until age 70, it's 1,320. So the difference between taking it early, 750, and taking it eight years later, 1320, that's forever. So you definitely want to lock down and stall, first stall, your Social Security to get to the maximum payment. And remember, if your maximum payment is 1320 a month, your spouse is at least worth half that, unless, of course, her Social Security is worth more than that. And then I want you to look at the crossover years. When you look at the crossover years for Social Security, should I take it at six, if I'm comparing 62 to age 66, that, that four year period, you'll actually get your money back by age 76. If you actually wait till age 62 all the way to age 70, the crossover year is age 79. 
if you actually compare full retirement age, in my case, 66, to full retire to my maximum age, age 70, to get my money back, I have to live to 81. So if my timeline was less than 81, I had sickness, I have short uh, longevity in my family, it's short, I would go ahead and maybe I'll take constructive receipt early. But for most Americans, it's totally worth the while to go ahead and wait till age 70. And those are your crossover years so that you can pretty much see what we're talking about. Don't forget to watch our next segment on Home Equity Conversion Mortgage, part four of our series on building a firm foundation for retirement. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or your financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. <laughs>